Doxology, hey, good morning. Good to see you guys. Uh, really good to sing with you. Wow. And uh, good to be back. Uh, if you're our guest today um, or if you kind of haven't been around for the last several weeks, uh, me either. So uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, I had a couple of weeks of vacation and then a couple of weeks of study leave where I uh, spent a couple of weeks working hard, but uh, praying and, and studying through some things, uh, sermon series that are coming up and uh, praying through vision-oriented things, praying for you guys. You gave us some uh, requests to pray for. I got to pray for all of those over the last couple of weeks. And I'm really, 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 really grateful for that, but so glad to be uh, back. Uh, I tell you, I, I did have a couple of people before the first service say, you know, um, you work one day a week, man, and like half a day at that. So why do you need all of that vacation? And uh, so I always feel like I got to tell you, there was part of that that was vacation, part of it that was working really, really hard. I'm grateful for all of it. Uh, like the number one question you guys are asking as I'm coming back is, hey, are you nice and rested? And uh, so let me just answer that question. The answer to that question, man, I don't know. So you remember the, the toys that you would get when you were a kid, the airplanes that had the propeller and you'd attach a rubber band to the propeller and then you'd crank it up and just kind of twist it up, twist it up, twist it up. The more you twisted it up, the further it launched when you launched it. You remember those toys that you had? So whatever that is, I feel like I got about four four weeks worth of getting turned up, and uh, if that's rested, I'm rested, whatever that is, I'm feeling it, but uh, I'm really, really excited for the fall, excited about today, and uh, glad that you're here. I do want to take just a second, uh, coming back on the other side of that, to tell uh, you thanks. Um, when our elders first told me uh, a couple of years that needed to be a priority for me, uh, both the vacation and the study time, uh, I had a really, really wise, really great friend that said, hey, receive both parts of that as a gift. And uh, every time you get to do it, just receive it as a gift, both the vacation and the study time. And so I, I really work hard to do that. And here's what I realize about gifts. Uh, the receiver of the gift doesn't have to pay anything for the gift, but the giver of the gift often pays a lot for the gift to be uh, experienced, especially when it's something extravagant, and I feel like that is. So, uh, so I just want to say uh, to those of you, our elders, that make that a priority for me, um, I realize that costs something, and I'm grateful uh, to you for making that a priority for my family and for me as a pastor, uh, for our staff that pays a little extra, like they work, a, a, get a couple extra responsibilities to make that happen, especially Justin and our leadership team. That's a big deal, and I want to tell them thanks. Um, to you who, uh, you, you show up every week, uh, you gave generously during July, that's always a big deal. Like we had a pretty good month July-wise, uh, and uh, I don't know that you think about that, but at the end of, uh, our, our fiscal year ends at the end of August, so we're kind of right in the middle of thinking towards that and praying towards that and planning. That's a part of that study leave is praying and envisioning and, and thinking through what God has for us in the days ahead. And gosh, it would be a bummer to go away, pull up on the yoke, pray really hard, come back with great vision and a tanked budget. And so thanks for not making me come back to something like that. And I'm really, really grateful. That's a big deal, uh, whether you recognize that or not. So thanks for that. And obviously, thank you to Gary Brandenburg and uh, Jay Felker for inspiring so many emails and texts from you saying, hey, if they'll keep showing up, you take as much time as you want. And uh, that's good. I do that on purpose. So uh, I, I want to make sure that July is one of those months that you just go, man, I don't miss July because Freeland's going to take care of us uh, even when he's not here and sometimes even better than if he was here. So grateful for that, grateful for you, and uh, really, really excited to be back. So here's what I want to do today. Uh, grab a Bible if you got one handy and make your way to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and if you need a Bible, grab one of these, go to page 826 in those uh, this morning, James chapter 3. We're launching into a brand new series this morning, you just start that, and, and what I thought maybe we would do as we launch back into a new series is maybe start the new series with a game. You, you could, Actually, not a game, uh, I felt like it might be fun, there's not a whole lot better than a really good church fight, so let's do battle this morning. You guys good with that? Here's the way this will work. Uh, I'm going to give you two things that tend to be in competition with each other, and I'm going to let all of us take a side. You're going to vote for which side you're on just by raising your hand when I give you the chance to raise your hand. That makes sense? Everybody in? All in, okay? This is an all play kind of thing. I'll give you the things you vote for which side you're on. It's easy as that. Ready? All right, so the first thing is this. Uh, cats and dogs. We'll start easy. All right? Where are the dog people? Yes, these are my people. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Okay, put your hands up. Where are the cat ladies? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, y'all keep your hands up. Everybody look around. This is the reason that we have a value of no perfect people allowed at Doxology Church. <laughs> no, I'm playing, I'm playing. I like cats. They taste like chicken. <clears throat> no, okay, okay. Well, let's move on. We'll do, we'll do something else. How about, um, how about Apple versus Android? Apple versus Android. Some people are passionate about this. Okay, where are the Apple people? Whoa, Apple people. 
All right, good. Where are the people that say, I like to actually keep my money in my pocket? <laughs> yeah, awesome, good. Some of the Android people. Okay, how about torchies or fuzzies? Are there some torchies people? Torchies people are here. Yeah, there are going to be a lot of you guys at Torchies today because I just planted the idea in your head. That's okay. Uh, where are the fuzzies people? Loyalists, Fort Worth people. Yeah, you're not catching that Austin disease. I get it. Fuzzies people. Love it. Okay, let's stay, let's stay on food. Okay, Heim and Railhead. Heim versus Railhead. We're the Heim people who are here. Yeah, bacon burnt Ed, say no more. Heim people are here. We're the Railhead people. They believe that you shouldn't have peer pressure to wear skinny jeans to a barbecue joint. <laughs> railhead people, yeah. Awesome. Okay, one more. Let's do one more. Uh, how about Big 12 SEC? Where are the SEC people? You hear them? They're overcompensating. <laughs> are there Big 12 people? Yeah, there are more sports than football. Yeah, good to have you guys here as well. Okay, we could keep going, couldn't we? Like, there are all kinds of things out there, and that's part of the point. Like, it's really easy for all of us to take sides on all kinds of things. It's really easy for there to be this us versus them mentality. And come on, when it comes to pets... When it comes to phones, when it comes to barbecue joints, it's really not that big a deal. When it gets to stuff that we really care about, it's a totally different story, isn't it? I mean, when we start talking about Republican versus Democrat, conservative versus liberal, it's a different, let's do that, okay? So, Repub no, I'm just kidding, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not do that. We talk Republican and Democrat, conservative, liberal, Public school, private school, home school, that gets serious, doesn't it? Vaccinate, don't vaccinate. Black lives matter, all lives matter. Pro-life, pro-choice. Like we could go on and on with those too, couldn't we? We haven't even started to get into things like theology and sexuality. And you mentioned stuff like that. Do you feel the temperature change in the room? And some of you are going, oh, we're talking about that today. Okay, well, where's the seatbelt in this thing? <laughs> because there's something about those issues that we just know make us and people around us crazy. Here's the crazy thing about the crazy things. We don't all agree on the crazy things. You notice that? Some of the things that just your neighbor is willing to go nuclear over aren't even a blip on the radar for you. Some of you experience this in your marriage. Things that your spouse just can't let go are things you don't even think about. Some of you teenagers, the stuff that drives your parents just crazy. And for the life of you, you can't figure out why it's such a big deal. It's a crazy big deal to them. And you don't know why. All of us have had the experience of being in a conversation with somebody that we know, and we know pretty well, and somebody that we don't know walks up and joins in the conversation. And all of a the sudden, they say something, and you just realize that they've said it, and they don't know that they've said it. They've stepped in it, and they don't know that they've stepped in it, but you know the person that's next to you, and the person that's just entered into the conversation doesn't know what you know, and you know that they just stepped on a landmine, and it's on. We're about to rumble, and they don't know that we're about to rumble. Because the crazy thing about the crazy things is everybody doesn't agree on which things are crazy. When it comes up, whatever it is, whoever we're with, people who were normally us, suddenly become them, and the stakes get high in a hurry. And the truth is, I don't think when it comes to any of these things, that Christ followers are a whole lot better at engaging them than anybody else. When it comes to social media, it comes to our marriages, it comes to our friends, it comes to our fraternities, our sororities, it comes to our neighborhoods, our HOAs, the Christ followers, we don't tend to be much better at it than anybody else. Not, becoming a Christ follower doesn't somehow magically absolve you from being really sorry at conflict. And it's kind of a shame, isn't it? Because Jesus and the writer of the New Testament said a lot about conflict, how to handle conflict. And here's what they tell us that you and I know, but the problem with us knowing it is we really only tend to remember when we find ourselves picking up the pieces of a conflict gone bad. What Jesus and the writer in the New Testament tell us, the way we fight often fights against the thing we're fighting for. 
you experience that? The thing, the way that we're fighting often fights against the thing we're fighting for. You ever won a fight and then discovered on the other side of the fight, we lost our mind in the process. We lost a relationship in the process. We lost a job in the process. We lost our credibility, our reputation, our purpose from God in the process. And God wants better for his people than that. So that's what I want to talk about for the next four weeks, how to fight without losing everything. I've got you in James chapter 3 uh, this morning. That's where we're going to start. James was the brother of Jesus. If you don't know anything about James, James grew up most of his life thinking that his brother was nuts, thinking that Jesus was absolutely crazy until Jesus called his own death and his own resurrection and pulled it off. And when somebody does that, it sort of changes the way you take what they say, right? And so uh, Jesus calls his own death, resurrection, pulls it off, and James goes, I think my brother is my Lord and my God, which is a big deal. James becomes the first formal leader of the very first organized church, church in Jerusalem. And he wrote a letter. That's the letter of James. And he wrote it to Christ followers everywhere, trying to help them understand how to live in the real world as a person that follows Jesus, how to not be a hypocrite as you navigate through real life. And in James's letter, relatively short letter, he gives two whole chapters to how to handle it when we interact with things that make us really, really mad. And that's where we're going to start the series today. Look at James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. James starts by asking us a question. Look what he says. He asks us, who is wise and understanding among you? Hey, stop right there for just a second. Isn't that what we're after when it comes to conflict that we're in? We want to be wise and understanding. So if you were around early in the year, we did a series about wisdom in the book of, book of Proverbs, and I gave you a definition for wisdom. Wisdom is a God's eye perspective for navigating real life in real time. And isn't that what we're after? Think back about the last fight you had. Don't you wish you'd had a God's eye perspective for navigating that real conflict, real life, in real time? And I don't know about you, I, I don't feel like I've ever got that. I feel like I'm really, really good at conflict before the conflict, when I'm in the shower in the morning before I know conflict's coming and I'm practicing how the conflict's going to go. Anybody else have conversations in the shower? You ever notice those conversations always go really well? I always say exactly what I want to say, exactly the way that I want to say it. And when I say it, they always respond exactly like I think they're going to respond. They respond exactly like I want them to respond. And I win every single argument I've ever had with another person when I'm imagining the conversation in the shower. Create a conflict before the conflict. I'm good at conflict after the conflict. You have those moments? You get in the car, drive away from a conflict, the conflict didn't go very well, and as you're sitting there in the car, suddenly you know all of the things that you should have said in the moment. The response that if you just thought in the moment to give that response, that answer in that moment, like it would have ended the argument, you would have won, it all would have been over. I'm just not good at conflict in the real world in real time. What I really need is perspective for navigating through real life conflict in real time. James says wisdom's what I need, but the truth is most of us don't have wisdom when it comes to fighting. And James asks the question, who's wise and understanding among you? James isn't expecting that a whole lot of our hands are going to go up. I wish I had that. Not really that. It's why I lose so many conflicts. Or it's why I lose so much in the conflicts that I win. James says, who is wise and understanding among you? Keep reading. Look what he says. Let them show it by their good arguments, strong opinions, and mic drop moments that come from wisdom. Except that's not what he says. He says, who's wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. You notice what he says? Okay, so we're not even to the issue yet. But this is really important for us. James says, wisdom is shown before it's said. Wisdom shown before it's said. How you stand in conflict is every bit as important as what you stand for in conflict. Does that mean what you're standing for doesn't matter? It's not what I'm saying. In fact, what 
James is going to argue and Paul is going to argue and Jesus is going to argue is that there are things worth standing for. There are things worth fighting for. All I'm saying is you can't value how you stand less than what you're standing for. And in fact, the more important the thing you're standing for is, the more important it is to pay attention to the way you're standing as you're standing for something. Because your posture is always more persuasive than your opinion. James says, wise people are always humble people, even before they're always right. They're humble. You know why? It's impossible to have a God's eye perspective on the world in real life, in real time, and believe that your world is all about you at the same time. Wise people are always humble. Keep reading. Look what he says, verse 14. But if you harbor, okay, if you allow to dock bitter envy, Selfish ambition in your hearts. Don't boast about it or deny the truth. James says this is what we tend to do. We've all got stuff that we want for ourselves. Stuff that we feel like we deserve. And rather than being willing to hold them with an open hand and sometimes send them out to sea, we bring them into the harbor. We begin to protect them. We give them safety so that they can't be challenged. We take what we want. We take the things we deserve. Listen, sometimes good things. Sometimes bad things. Sometimes big things. Sometimes small things. And we tie them off to immovable things. So that the only way there's ever going to be movement, in the conflict that we're in, is for you to come my way. Because my way can't budge. And if you don't come my way, if you won't come my way, if you can't come my way, must be because there's something wrong with you. And James says, don't kid yourself. That wisdom isn't wise. It doesn't come from God. And he tells us something that we already know, we've already experienced, whether or not he says it. He says, where you find that kind of thinking, that kind of living in real time in the real world, here's what you find. You find disorder and every evil practice. He says, where you kind of find that kind of thinking, you find our political system. When you find that, when you find that way of navigating through conflict, you find the wreckage, disorder of your broken marriage. Where you find that kind of thinking, that way of operating, that's where you find your roommate situation. Where you find your relationship with your parents. It's where you find the culture at your office. Disorder and every evil practice, gossip, betrayal, revenge, character assassination, all of it. But he goes on. There's a better way. Look what he says, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, And sincere. Now stop. Isn't that what you want in your relationship? Isn't that what you want in your marriage? Isn't that what you want at your office? Isn't that what you want at your fraternity and your sorority? Peace loving? We're going to come back to this next week. But don't you want to be in a relationship with people that value flourishing above fighting? Wouldn't it be awesome if our political system was a little more like that? Peace-loving, considerate, submissive, the kind of relationship that goes, you first. No, 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 you first. No, 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 you first. Full of mercy and good fruit. What you're left with after the argument isn't squishy and doesn't stink. Impartial and sincere. You reach a fair agreement. There aren't inter- ulterior motives. That... That's fighting without losing. So how do I get that in my house? How do I get that in my marriage? How do I get some of that in my office? The place that I live, how do I get that with my friends? 
That's where we're going to go in this series. That's my introduction to the series. Now let's get to the message for today. I'll have you out of here by dinner. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Jay gives, James gives us a, a, a first step towards that result. And we've already sort of alluded to it. James goes on to say, if you really, really, really want to get the fight right, you're going to have to get the spider, not just the web. You got to figure out what causes it, and you got to go to the cause and fix the cause if you want to get the fight right. He's hoping we'll ask a question. What's the question? Well, what's the cause? What causes the fights? What causes the quarrels among us? James says, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Two different words there. The word for fight is a word that literally means states of war. James just described some of our marriages, right? Teenagers, James just described the culture at some of your houses. Like it's not missiles flying 100% of the time, but everybody's always got their finger on the red button just in case. States of war, fights. He also uses the word quarrels. This is the Freeland children during the summertime. It's some of your office cultures, some of your roommate situations, skirmishes all the time, some of your HOAs. Everybody's always fighting about something. The thing is, it just never seems to be the same something. Everybody's always fighting, just kind of at each other, always fights and quarrels. James says, what causes that? Some of you say, you know what, um, that's not the right question. Like, the right question isn't what causes that. The right question is who causes that. And I know the answer to that. The answer to who causes that is her mom causes fights and quarrels among us. Like every time she shows up, she's just at it. She says that one thing and it's always the same thing. And we were fine before she showed up. Then she starts in on her laundry list of stuff to be critical over. And now not only are we fighting with her, now we're fighting with each other and the kids are fighting with us and we're fighting with the kids, kids fighting with other. What? It's not what causes the quarrels, it's who. And it's her every time she's here. Who causes the fights and quarrels? It's that guy at work. It's him. Every time he shows up in the conversation, it's something. And everybody just starts to go at each other, always stirring stuff up, stirring the pot, starting the gossip. It's him who causes fights and quarrels among us. Some of us say, it's the kids. Like, we were doing fine. We were happy. We got a little too happy. Nine months later, kids show up. Now we're tired all the time. We're broke all the time. We're fighting all the time. Who causes the fights and quarrels? It's the kids. The kids cause the fights and the quarrels among us. It's not what. It's who. James doesn't ask who. He doesn't ask who started it. He asks what starts it. And then he answers the question. What causes the fights and quarrels among you? Look at verse 1. Don't they come from your desires? that battle within you. Here's what James is saying. you got to get this if you want to get good at conflict. If you don't want to lose the next fight with your spouse, with your roommate, with your boss, with your kids, here's what you got to understand. You will never fully resolve an external conflict until you first understand an internal battle. You will never fully resolve an external conflict until you first understand an internal battle. The word for desires, James uses there, it's a word that refers to the things that I want for me right now. And we've all got those. A counselor would call it the presenting problem. It's the costume that the issue puts on for the fight. It's the right now thing that in your marriage or your relationship, your office culture that lights the fuse, the thing that ignites the powder keg, the thing that pulls the pin. James says all of us have real-time things right now that we want, that we desire, and they bounce around inside of us. And sometimes they cause friction within us and they ignite. And James doesn't say that they're all bad. 
doesn't say that they're all illegitimate desires. Some of them are good desires, holy desires. And some of them are evil desires. But the thing is, without wisdom, we don't know which is which. We always assume we know which one is which. Because we know us and we know our heart. We know our intent. So we just assume that the thing that we want right now is the right thing for us to want right now. Using James's illustration, it's something that we've harbored in our heart. We pulled it in. We allowed it to dock. We tied it off to really good things, holy things. We've sheltered it and protected it and justified it to the point that for someone else to not want that for us or to not give that to us must mean that they're evil and must be destroyed. I mean, keep looking. Look what James says, verse 2. He says, you desire, but you don't have, so you kill. Okay, maybe not literally, but look at some of our marriages. We're honest. Some of our relationships, the way we use social media against other people, the things that we'll say about people in our class. Think about some of our office cultures, the way we will destroy a person's reputation. The way that will destroy a person's sense of being, belonging. Killing's not that far off, is it? And some of the people who are the victims of some of the things that we've said and done in our world when we're angry and they didn't give us what we wanted, kind of wish they were dead. You don't have what you want, so you kill. He says you covet, but you, underline this, cannot get what you want. Even with that... You cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Isn't that a crazy thing? So we destroy a person in an argument, we destroy their reputation, or we just destroy them in an argument, and then we discover at the end of the argument that we still don't have the thing that we really wanted? Have you ever had that experience? Do you have a fight? You owe me an apology. I want an apology right now. Then they give you the apology. You win the argument, and you discover on the other side of the apology that the apology wasn't what you really wanted, and you wish you'd fought for the other thing. But you wasted it, fighting for the one thing. Some of you have had this experience in your marriage about something silly. You had a knockdown, drag out fight about him playing golf one Saturday. And you won. He didn't play golf. But as he sat there on the sofa, you realized golf wasn't really the thing that you wanted. Because he's not playing golf. And you still don't have what you wanted. What the fight was really about was relational intimacy. You wanted time together. But you won the fight. He's not playing golf. And you still don't have what you really wanted. I talked to someone the other day talking about a fight among some of their single friends. One of their single friends in particular, they were fighting because one of them didn't get invited to a party that a bunch of them went to and a picture from the party showed up on Facebook. The crazy thing is the one who was really mad, the one who didn't get what she wanted right this second, right this second, she couldn't have gone to the party anyway. She was busy that night. The party wasn't the issue. The issue is she wanted to belong. She wasn't fighting about the party, but she fought about the party. I love the way that she put it when she realized it. The issue is sometimes I feel like I'm nobody's priority. That's really the issue. Fight about that. That's James's point. There's a war inside every single one of us between what I want right this second and what I really want at the end of the day. And those aren't always the same thing. Come on, we know this looking in hindsight. We almost never know it in the moment. I mean, look back. When you look back at high school you, high schooler, when you look back at elementary school you, isn't it true if you'd always gotten what you always wanted, you'd have never gotten where you always wanted to go? We know that when we look back. We almost never see it in real time. Yet James says, you have to understand that you've got that tendency and you didn't grow out of it. Especially when you get ready to do conflict. Otherwise, you'll be tempted to fight for the wrong thing. And you won't discover it until you get it. And realize it's not what you wanted. You've got to have enough wisdom to ask a real question, the real world in real time. Is this thing that I'm fighting for in conflict with what I really want in the end. To say it another way, if the fight that you're fighting won't win you what you really want, 
you're losing, even if you're winning. Say it again, the fight that you're fighting, if it won't win you what you're really wanting, you're losing, even if you're winning, the fight. You know what James goes on to say? He says, part of the reason this is such a huge deal for us and a trap that we fall into over and over and over and over again is that sometimes when we ask this question, we realize that the thing that we desire right this second, right this moment, is not what we really want. And what we really want, they weren't created to give. Some of us are looking to our spouse to be our savior. And he wasn't created to be your savior. He will never be your savior. And if you lean on him to be your savior, you'll destroy him. And you, in the process, spouses were created to point towards a savior. Never replace him. If you're looking to your friends to form your identity, if you're looking to a boss to give you a sense of meaning and purpose and value, you will never win what you're really wanting out of them. So what do we do with those things that we really want when we discover what they are? Well, James says, take them to the one who created them in the first place. Look at verse 2. He says, you don't have, it's not because you didn't get it from them, you don't have because you didn't ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. He says, you don't ask. And when you do ask, you don't get because you ask wrong so that you can spend what you get on your pleasures. If you got your Bible and you're a note taker in your Bible, circle the word pleasures and then go back to verse 1 where it talks about desires. Circle that and draw a line that connects the two. It's the exact same word. You ask God for what you want so that you can spend what you want on the thing that you want right this second, right this moment. And James says, there's a God in heaven, your heavenly Father in heaven often knows that what you're asking for right this second is in conflict with what you ultimately desire. And he loves you too much to give it to you. Every single conflict provides a window for us into a battle that's happening within us. And James says, if you can recognize that, if you can deal with that, if you can catch that spider you'll be well on your way to wisdom. You'll find yourself fighting without losing whatever you're fighting for, whoever you're fighting with, in real life, in real time, whatever it's about. So let me give you something to try this week that you're going to think is weird until you try it, but I promise you it'll be worth it. Okay, here's what I want. At some point this week, every single one of us is going to find ourselves in a conflict. Just reality. Okay? You're going to find yourself in a conflict. Maybe it's a conflict at home. Maybe it's a conflict uh, in class, at work, someplace that you find. You're, wherever you find yourself in a conflict with another person, I want you to try this little experiment. I heard it from a guy that was talking to students a long, long time ago. When he said it, I just thought, that's crazy. Then I tried it, and I thought, that's brilliant. So I'm going to give it to you uh, today. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. You're going to find yourself in a conflict with another person. Listen, doesn't matter what it's about. Could be a big thing or a bad thing, a, lo- a little thing. Good thing, bad thing. Doesn't matter. When you find yourself in a conflict and you have that moment that you realize, gosh, I'm in a fight. I wish I could say the right thing at the right time in the right way. Here's what I want you to say. And I want you to say it out loud in person to the person that you're fighting with. You ready? Here's what I want you to say. I want you to say these words. Ready? You know what part of the problem is, don't you? I'm not getting what I want. I can tell you're not convinced. Isn't that what James said part of the problem is? He doesn't say it's the only problem. Doesn't say you're the only one with the problem. But didn't James say part of the problem is you're not getting what you want? Here's what I want to just invite you to do. I just want you to name the spider. I want you to call it out. I want you to say it out loud. You know what part of the problem is, don't you? I'm not getting what I want. 
Okay, so you're going to need some practice. I want to practice it out loud. Okay, can we do it? Uh, so here, here it is. I think it's up on the screen. I just want you to say it out loud with me. You find yourself in a conflict sometime this week with another person, whatever it's about, whoever it's with, I want you, in the, as soon as you realize you're in a conflict, to just say these words outside. These are the right words at the right time in real life, okay? Here are the words. We're going to say them together. You ready? You know what part of the problem is, don't you? I'm not. Now that lacked a little conviction. Let's try it one more time. You find yourself in a fight, husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, neighborhood, coworker. When you find yourself in a fight, as soon as you realize you're in a fight, you're searching for the right words in the right way at the right time, you're going to say out loud, you know what part of the problem is? If you'll do that, two things will happen for you in the moment. The first thing that's going to happen, you're going to squash the spider. You're going to start yourself down the road of clarity and humility that, listen, James says comes from wisdom. You're going to find yourself on a path that might just help you fight the rest of the fight without losing. That's the first thing you'll do. You know the second thing that you'll do? You will totally, completely blow their mind. And in that moment, while they scramble to figure out what just happened to the fight that I was in, you'll have just enough time to ask yourself three questions. You don't have to ask them out loud. You can ask them privately, but I want you to ask three questions at that moment. You, ask, you say out loud, you know what part of the problem is, don't you? I'm not getting what I want. And they go, uh, um, uh, um. While they're stammering, you ask yourself three questions. Okay, you ready for them? Let me give them to you. Here's the first one. What do I really want for myself? What do I really want for myself? Ask yourself the question in the moment. What's this really about? What am I fighting for? I'm getting ready to do war over golf. I'm getting ready to do battle over a deal. I'm going to do battle over a party that I didn't get invited to. I'm getting ready to do war with this person over their politics. Whatever it is, ask yourself the question, what is this really about? That's the first question. What do I really want for myself? Second question. What do I really want for us? The person that you're toe-to-toe -to -toe with, nose-to-nose -nose with, what do I really want for us? What do I really want for this relationship at the end of the day? And if those two things are in conflict, what I really want and what I really want for us at the end of the day, if they're in conflict, listen, you've got to pay attention to that. Is the thing I'm about to start a fight over or continue a battle over End a fight over. Is it worth losing a whole day, a whole week, a whole season of relationship over? Do I want us closer together or further apart when this fight is over? Do I want us on speaking terms after this? If you're hoping for the cold shoulder, sleeping on the couch, never talk to each other again, sworn enemies till Jesus returns, then proceed as you would normally proceed in the fight. But I bet you don't want that for us, whoever us is. What do you really want for the relationship at the end of the day? And then the last thing, what would I do or say next if I really wanted what I say I really want? What would I say, what would I do next if I really wanted what I say, I really want for myself and for us. What's the next step for me from here? And then do that. So that doesn't mean that the fight goes away. It doesn't always. Doesn't mean that you always get what you wanted from the fight. Sometimes you won't. But it means you'll get the fight right. And you'll fight over the right things. Ask yourself the question, what would I do? What would I say next if what I really wanted is what I say I really want? If you do that, James says, you'll be wise. And you won't be the person that loses the rest of your week. You won't be the person that loses the rest of your career, the rest of your marriage, the rest of your legacy for something that you desperately want right this second, but that takes you further away from what you really want in the end. At the end of the day, you know what James says? Chapter 4, verse 6. He says, God 
opposes the proud. But he gives favor to the humble. Listen, it is not a recipe for victory in whatever fight you're in to have the God of the universe line up on the opposing side. So our question, whatever fight we're in, how do we make 100% sure that God is on our side of the fight? That's the question we're going to answer next week. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that we follow a Jesus who chose not to just grab what he wanted in the moment, but instead chose to fight for us so that we could have what we need to have life with him forever, which is what he wanted in the end. Lord, for the person that came today that uh, they don't know you, they've tried hard to be good and they're trying religion, hoping it helps, and trying to work their way to you, Pray that today they would understand that they can never work their way to you, but that you worked your way to them and that Jesus gave up what he wanted in the moment, safety and comfort, to avoid a cross. But he set his face toward it and endured it, despised its shame, so that we could be forgiven and free. And he offers it to us as a gift that costs us absolutely nothing, although it cost him his life. Lord, for those of us that have responded to that message, I pray that we would reflect that message in our offices, in our homes, in our marriages, with our friends and our coworkers and our church, that we would be people who look like you, who show who you are and what you're like, who say who you are and what you're like wherever we go, whatever fight we're in. Would you let us stand for the right things? And God, please, would you let us be people that stand the right way for the right things? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.